you out there. So listen, here's how we're going to do this. We don't praise, we don't worship. Anybody just want to hear something from the Lord? Uh, amen. So I'm going to give you a message this morning, but I told them, I said, y'all, I really feel a conversation in my spirit this morning, and I want to, if you know anything about me, probably, yeah, because I'm going to sit right here. If you know anything about me, I'm a conversationalist, right? And so I love to have conversations, especially with this generation, because they're so creative, they're so intelligent, they're so innovative. And But what I've learned is that they don't necessarily enjoy church. And so I have a lot of conversations about life, about things in the word, about where they are. And, uh, and it's very interesting to me to watch. I was uh, going over some numbers this week and I was saying something. I've watched different generations and I'm watching it happen. I'm watching, we have baby boomers, we have Gen X, we have millennials, we have Gen Z. And whether you know it or not, God wants to be a part of every generation and he wants to um, really transform our lives. I don't care if you're a baby boomer, it ain't over. God is still trying to transition and transform. And so we were having some conversations on Wednesday night and one of the ladies, she's actually here, she's 68 years old. And the way she's been able to go through fire on Wednesday night has been mind-blowing to me. Because as I look at things, I look at Gen Z, they, 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 they down for whatever, you know, fix me, help me, whatever ain't a part of me that's supposed to be, that's stopping me, get it out, let's do it, right? They ain't scared, period. Millennials are not really afraid, but they think they know everything, amen, help me. So you have to fight them a little bit harder, but you know, Pastor T good on that. She got enough gangster to get with them. And then there's my generation, Gen X, which we was told what happened in this house, stay in this house, you don't tell nobody. When they call, you tell them I ain't here, don't you answer no questions. So when you ask us our truth, we like, what you mean? We don't tell that stuff. You know, what happened? We don't tell that stuff. And then what I'm learning, though, is baby boomers, most people would think they would be harder, but I think X is harder than baby boomers because I'm watching baby boomers go through fire and deal with their stuff. And we got a star student. I really wasn't supposed to put on blast this morning, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sister Vicky, stand up right quick. That's our star student. My God! That lady told me, that lady told me she's 68 years old. Do that lady look 68 years old? My God. I said, I want to be like her when I grow up. But she has blessed my heart because I've watched her do this with flying colors and learned so many things about herself and about God. And so as I was uh, as I was talking to some of the other ones, I was talking just about the integrity of this generation, their, their integrity with God, and just really wanting to walk out what he's called them to walk out and what that looks like for them. And so I got some answers that really excited me. One young lady told me, she said, Pastor T, I feel like this process, and the process, for those of y'all that don't know, is we have a thing called Wednesday Night Fire. And so the goal is to get everything to deal with the things of our past so we can walk out the future that God has for us in a nutshell. And um, I was asking one of the young ladies and what she said to me was she, she just hugged me because Wednesday night this past week was the end of it for a lot of them. And um, she said, I'm just grateful. She said, because I feel like this process has taken me from religion to relationship. And I said, really? You know, and I asked her to explain that to me. And she began to tell me what she felt like it had done. So I'm going to invite her to the stage, Miss Maya Knox. Amen. 
Amen. Come on, Maya. And then I got another guy. I'm going to talk about some people in the word, but I want them to talk to me about what it looks like walking blameless and walking faithful and walking obedient to God in a generation. And I got another one, Mr. Jason James. Come on, let you. And then there's this other guy who I actually gave birth to, and boy, y'all don't even want to hear some of the conversations we have. Lord, have mercy. And if y'all know PJ, he don't ever stop the conversation, go like three hours, and you still, you still don't agree. Amen. Come on to this stage, young man, Octavia. My baby. And so this morning, we have a thing at 9 o'clock, if you ever want to come, it's our 9 o'clock service, but in 9 o'clock, it's a little different from this because we dialogue with each other sometimes. And so in our nine o'clock, we discuss integrity. And I'm going I'm to have a conversation with them about what we talked about at nine o'clock. But I want Maya to break down some of the stuff she was saying first. So what we talked about at nine o'clock was we went to Genesis and we talked about Noah. And most of us know Noah as a man who built the boat. You know, if you've been to anybody's Sunday school, you know about Noah and the ark, right? And so, but what we don't understand is why God had Noah to build the ark. What we don't understand is that God looked all over the world and did not find one person that he wanted to save but Noah. And so the Bible says in Genesis 6 and 9, it says that he wanted to save Noah because Noah was righteous, Noah was blameless, and Noah was faithful. And we talked about he was a man of integrity, so God told him, listen, I'm about to destroy this world, but I'm going to save you and your people. And so that, that right there will preach by itself because it shows that your integrity and your faithfulness to God will not only save you, but it'll save your children. And so the Bible didn't just have Noah to go in the boat. Noah was able to take his children and their spouses and his spouse in there. So if you don't want to walk blameless for no other reason, do it for your children. Amen. Amen. And so we talked about the fact that to be righteous is to walk right according to God. And what we said was in this generation, we believe that we're supposed to walk right, but it's more about walking right according to what people think is right. We don't want to violate our mama because we know she's going to be mad. We don't want to violate our sister them because we know they ain't going to talk to us for the next month. So we want to do right according to what people call right. And if God tells us to do something that people don't think is right and that people don't like, we won't even do the thing God asked us to do. Because we're more concerned about their right than his. So to walk righteous is to walk according to what God calls is right. James 4.17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do, do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Yeah. It's sin to know right and not do right. Then we talked about being blameless, meaning that no one can point their finger and say, yeah, she said she knew God, but look at her, she just like us. Look at him. He just, y'all know what I'm talking yeah. about. And so they know you go to church and you invite them to church, but when y'all get together on Saturday, they can't, you ain't blameless. They can't really tell what you belong to. Uh-oh. <laughs> Faithful to God, what did that mean? That meant that he always remained righteous. When things were good, he kept serving God. Y'all see it. And when the flood came, Noah didn't turn his back on God. So when things were good, he served God. When things were bad, he served God. When they were laughing at him building this boat. Because here's the thing that we don't understand about the boat. If you study it, it took Noah about 100 years to build this doggone boat. A hundred years. We don't want to wait one. God tell us to do something for one year and we completely sell out on him. So Noah kept serving God when people were laughing at him and people thought he was stupid and they thought the idea was done. dumb. They had never even seen rain before, but Noah stayed faithful to God and Noah obeyed God to the letter no matter what they thought. Yeah. Right? That made him faithful. Well, I said he was faithful when the cameras were rolling and when they were off. Y'all know how we are. Come on. Come on. When certain people around, we one way. When they ain't around, we another way. You know, when mom and them around, we one way. When they ain't around, we another way. When my spouse around, I'm one way. When my spouse ain't around, I'm another way. When Pastor T around, I'm one way. When I'm, I asked them last Sunday, I said, what if we were going to play on this screen back here what you did all week? 
would you still do it? Would you be more conscious of what you did through the week? What you said, who you were with? Y'all know what I'm talking about? The answer is yes. But the cameras of heaven are always rolling. And it says that we've been called to be faithful. Not just on Sunday. I said we've called people who know how to show up for church. We've called them faithful. But God said we are the church. I am the church. It says that I am his building. You are God's building according to 1 Corinthians 3 and 9. 1 Corinthians 16, 3 and 16 says I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that the spirit of God dwells in me. And so we looked at another man as well. Noah wasn't the only man that walked in integrity and in integrity of spirit. It was a man named Job. Anybody ever heard of Job? Y'all remember Job? Job, Job, the enemy was looking and doing stuff. And, and, and God pointed to Job in Job 2 and 3. And he said, have you considered my servant Job? Go on, mess with him if you want to, because he ain't going nowhere. Can God say that about you? Are you a person of integrity? Can, can, can God say, pick him, pick him, pick him, pick him, pick her? Because she ain't leaving me. I don't care what you do. Can God have that much faith in you? It says, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast to what? His integrity. That's a bad word. I asked him what integrity means. It said to do what's right when ain't nobody looking. Woo! Although you have cited against him to destroy him, he holds fast to his integrity. Not only that, Job's wife show us that he was integral. See, it's one thing for us to think you integrity, but what the folk in your house think? Because they see you for real, for real. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It said his wife said to him in 2 and 9, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? What was she asking Job? Job had lost all his children. Job had lost all his flock. Job had lost all his riches. When the, when the enemy, when, when God asked the enemy, have you considered Job? Did God allow the enemy to destroy everything around Job? Why? To prove that he's a man of integrity. Integrity. I got somebody that love me no matter what you bring Come on. Yeah. they ain't going can God say that about you what do those in your household say it's easy for you to fool us on a Sunday morning but what is it like on Saturday when you get angry and Friday when you get bored and Thursday when you get lonely are you a man or woman of integrity and so what made Job a man of integrity was that he feared the Lord. Yes. And fear don't mean scared. It means he reverenced God and he yes. cared about what God thought over yes. what everybody yes. thought. Mm -hmm. We try to impress people, but how impressed is he by you? Are you afraid? Are you in reverence to him in such a way that what he thinks matters to you? And so what we do is we tell God, I'll serve you if you do it my way. God, if you bless me, I'll go to church. God, if you bless me, I'll start back praying. God, if you do this for me, I'll tithe. God, if you do this for me, I'll read my scripture. God, if you do this for me. He said, no, 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 no. No, you got this thing backwards. If you do that for me, then I'll do this. You ain't God, I am. And so I want you to look at your integrity. Can God trust you? You've been asking God for stuff, but can he trust you? What we can see with these two men is that God actually picks people. God picked Noah. He said, out of everybody here, I ain't got nobody but you that'll do what I say. And he picked Job. He picked Job to be picked on. He said, uh-uh-uh, pick Job. Go on, pick on him. Go on, go on, mess with everything and watch what happens. And if you know the story, Job kept serving God. Job got upset. He asked God a bunch of questions. And God asked Job a whole bunch of questions back. But at the end, God gave Job everything he ever thought he lost and double. Yeah. Yeah. He's just looking for integrity. So Maya, we had a conversation on Wednesday night and what you told me was, you said, Pastor T, in a nutshell, I didn't really know I was supposed to walk in integrity. I thought I was supposed to come here and hear you preach and, and what you say, girl? <laughs> Tell the people. 
I just want y'all to begin to hear, and then we're going to come back to the people in the scripture, but I want you to begin to hear. I want a generation to understand some stuff. Because to be honest, I didn't know they didn't understand. Y'all got to remember, I'm a pre-PK. Like, we, we, we was always thought we were supposed to walk right. Like, it was an expectation whether we did it or not. And so, uh, so when I listen to them, I get some things that I just didn't understand. So help us understand. Good morning, Maya. What did you What did you tell me Wednesday? <laughs> so like prior to moving back home in like 2018, and even some of the time right here, it's like, okay, I'm a part of church. The pastor reached out to me. Um, I love her, so I'm gonna come to church. But in the in doing that, it just made me like do whatever she asked or do what the church needed but still do what I wanted to do on the outside kind of thing so it was never I'm doing this because I love God and I want to serve him I'm just doing it like for image basically I was very image driven like I just want to do this look good you know on the outside but on the inside I'm just hurting and just doing what I want to do and just breaking God's heart so what is different now what made it different what what's what how do you see it now um, now it's more of a relationship, like to break his heart breaks my heart. Um, doing, serving him is a joy. It's fun. It doesn't feel like a chore as it once did. At one point it used to feel like a chore to me, but now I genuinely enjoy doing it. And I feel like when you deal with things of the past or deal with hurt and rejection and things like that, it just, um, leaves room for God to really feel you, his spirit to feel you. And that's when the relationship really formed. You said, Maya, you said to me, you said, Pastor P, I feel like God really loves me now. Like, I can really go to him. Like, it's this closeness that I mm -hmm. didn't know before. Tell us about that closeness. So, like, the closeness. So, I've been in the church for a while. So, I was, when Pastor T tell us to, like, study and stuff like that, the first thing she said, if you don't know where to go, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, this is an example from like last week. And so I was about to study that, but then God told me to study Proverbs. So then I started studying Proverbs. It was talking about like trust and reverence to him and truly um, honoring him. And it was talking about wisdom. And I was like, oh my God, because we always hear people talk about like the Proverbs 31 woman. So I was like, what else does Proverbs say? And God just showed me so much wisdom and reverence for him. It was mind blowing. So when you have a relationship, it really, he talks to you. He speaks to you. He brings conviction. Like you could be doing something and you'd be like, oh God, I know I was supposed to be doing this. <laughs> you will say something, you'd be like, oh, or he'll, now he'll stop you sometimes, but you know, we still a devil in our own will. And God would be like, no, ma'am. <laughs> amen. 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 So, Jason, when you hear the word integrity, when you hear the word integrity, um, I heard you say some things Wednesday night about your walk and how it was in and out and some of the cycles and how you feel like you've been walking in integrity for how long, you say now? A few years. A few years. Y'all give it up for Jason. <laughs> and so, but what you said, Tell them what you said, your your story, your cycles. Talk to them about it. Uh, well, we had to write letters to ourselves, and um, my letter was to myself. I was uh, mainly when I looked at my life over the past, I don't know, ten to fifteen years. Um, I would always fall into the same sin cycles, right? And it was a thing of um, got married in two thousand nine. Um, and I preached my first sermon in 2009, you know, um, and it's like I made a vow. I told God, man, I, I'll never be a hypocrite. Like, this is not what I'm going to do. And in my mind, I feel like, okay, everything is going to change from this point, you know. But before then, of course, you know, um, when I was in college, there was, uh, of course, a lot of weed, alcohol, sex, a whole bunch of just stuff, right? And so you repent ask God for forgiveness, and you move on. Then when I got married and started preaching, okay, this, this whole thing is going to change. I ask God for forgiveness, I'm good, right? But I really didn't have that relationship there with him uh, to keep it, you know? So I fell right back into the sin cycle of the same weed and infidelity and just the same stuff. And it, it kept happening over and over and over. And, like, it got to a point for me where, 
I would do things and really, like, in my, in my heart, like, God, I don't want to do this no more, but I would still do them. I would still do those things. And so it wasn't until um, I learned about deliverance, right, really getting delivered from these things, and y'all, we, we need some deliverance. But learning about deliverance and truly, truly coming to an understanding of how much God actually loves me, yes. right? Yes. Um, learning my identity in him. When I, when I really got a grasp on God's love, that's when the game changed for me, you know, um, and that was a few years ago. Um, and so once I got a grasp on God's love and how he truly loved me, regardless of who I was, regardless of what I've done, right, that's literally, man, going, understanding God's love and getting some deliverance, that's when the cycle stopped for me. Um, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing of where when you're younger, we learned about Jesus, and it was more about uh, fear. Do this, or you're going to go to hell. <laughs> I'm so serious. And most people have that testimony, right? It's, it's re like real legalistic, man. Like, you do this, uh, it's, it's hell for you, right? And so we came up learning about God, and, and it was like in, in fear. Like, it was, it was fear to, you know, you, to be a Christian, right? It, we're going to make you afraid so you can act this way versus having a relationship with the Father, knowing that I love God, He loves me, right? And so I'm going to live right just simply out of my love and adoration for Him, right? So when you have that in that relationship, man, it's like you don't want to do anything to mess that up. God, my, my relationship and my love, God, is so important. This is where I want to stay. I don't want to mess this up. So it's not a thing of where I'm living like this because I don't want to go to hell. I ain't studying hell. I know I'm not going to hell. My concern is, am, am I messing my relationship with him? My relationship with him? Yeah, so. Okay, I got a question. So now you said that you don't want to be afraid. So what's the difference in that fear you talked about and the fear of God that we just talked about? What's the difference in the fear? That you was talking about, I got to be scared I'm going to go to hell. What's the difference in that and the fear of the Lord that Pastor T just talked about? It's uh, different. It is different. So you think about when uh, the Bible tells you to fear God, like in fear and trembling. It's more of a reverential fear, right? Um, and I, I think the thing, more than anything else, um, God, in our relationship with him, God wants you to fear him, but it's not like a thing of necessarily being scared of him almost. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a complete, God, I have complete reverence for you. It's a reverential fear. And so um, it's not a, Christianity, it shouldn't be a thing of where you just walk around and just your whole thought process is, I'm not doing this, so I'm going to go to hell. Oh, I can't do that. I'm going to go to hell. Right. Because what we do is we project that onto other people. So you'll have an unbeliever that don't know nothing about God or anything like that. You're the only Jesus they see, and your whole conversation with them is about them not going to hell. How are you going to reach them like that? Yeah. You know, so the whole thing is how we reach people is with the love of the Father, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's how you reach them. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go to that. But, no but, no, but that's how you reach them. You don't reach people with fear, right? People come in, they might live a lifestyle that you don't, that, that you don't necessarily believe in or whatever the case may be, and your whole, thought, your whole thing is, man, well, if you live like that, you're going to hell. How are you going to reach them like that? How are you going to reach them? It's almost like hate, right? And so the thing is, what we have to do as a body of believers more than anything else is love. Yeah. We got to love. Good stuff. So I got a question. So can God pick you? He said, "Can you tr have you tried my servant Jason? You ready yet?" Listen, listen. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Now, let me let me let me say this. I, hey, listen, listen. Now hold on. I preached about Job several times, and here's my thing. He can pick me. I just don't want him to. <laughs> God, please don't. <laughs> I don't want to go through that. <laughs> oh God. Like, Lord, you can however. Amen. 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 All right, Octavius. So, Octavius is the youngster of the bunch. He's 19, going on 20. All right. And so, um, you're in college. You're a college student. And I want to talk about, really quick, I want you to answer me about integrity in this generation, how difficult is it to walk? First of all, what does an integral walk look like for you as a college student in the everyday life? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Test. 
Uh, a lot of it is, I think when you were talking about it this morning, a lot of it is just saying no. Like, mm -hmm. it's just as simple as that, just like no. And uh, for me, not for me, it's not difficult. I think it's difficult, but when you understand why it gets less difficult. Wow. Like, I think for me, it's like, I got this foundation built on Jesus, and if I get away from that, everything is going to go bad. Yeah. And so it's more so of like, I don't want that to happen, so <laughs> Jesus, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. So no, it's like, when you build your foundation there, and it's like, if I build something that's not on that foundation, whether it's relationships or friendships or whatever it is, like, if I have something that's not built on Jesus, it's not going to be good. So I don't want it. So it's kind of. What are some of the things you have to say no to? Um, all the stuff Jason talked about. So when you talk about sexual sin and um, you got clubbing and all of that, like a lot of that stuff is it's hard to say no to because it's like that's the trend. You know what I mean? So not following the trend is extremely difficult. So 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 doing it is. Mm -hmm having a why. So your why is not necessarily... That's not my only why, but that's a big why. It was kind of like what you said. His why was because he, well, he didn't want it to happen. <laughs> he said he ain't want to go... What? It ain't hell. It's more like hell on earth for all of Right. I don't right. want Joe with Joe with the... Okay. Okay, so... In a nutshell, to walk in integrity in this day and time, what is the reward, either one of y'all, what is the reward of walking faithful, of walking blameless, of really loving God and being who you said you were going to be? What's the reward? Peace. Oh, God. Anybody need peace? Hey. Man, that's worth it right there. My I think, God. I think um, a big reward is people coming to Jesus because of you. Wow. So Good stuff. Jason talked about, like he talked about how we might be the version of Jesus that people get. One of my biggest thing is I might be the only version of Jesus that people get, so what version am I giving them? So when you give them a version, they receive that version, they receive Jesus because of that. That's a huge. Yeah. That's what's up. All right. I would honestly just say blessings. Um, if God knows he can trust you with things, then he'll reveal stuff to you. He'll give stuff to you because he know you can handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So God, I think God blesses those that he trusts. Wow. 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 All right. Y'all give it up for them. So here's what I want to do for each person in this room. I want to give you an opportunity because the reason I wanted them to come up is because sometimes we can get it confused and think that the pastor is the only one that's supposed to walk upright and walk with God and live for God. You think the person in the front, that's the reason you think you could come to church. This is what we believe. We believe that we walk in the house and let the upright person talk to us. Amen. Please. And so, but the reason I wanted them to speak is because I want this generation and people in this room, I praise God for Sister Vicky. Oh my God, we taking her out today if y'all wanna go. We so excited about that lady. And so it takes humility to walk in integrity because the first thing you have to do in integrity, we talked about it this morning, is be honest. You have to be honest about, God, here's where I am and Here's my weakness, and here's my struggle. And the man of God on Wednesday night, he said, I had these sin cycles, Pastor T, of porn and smoking and drinking. And even when I started preaching, I found myself back in those cycles. And so I wanted you to hear the story because, you know, I don't like anybody to feel judged. That's just kind of one of my things, and I can't stand the spirit of shame. Because if the enemy can keep you shame of it, he can keep you bound by it. Because if you're too shame to tell anybody, you'll never be able to come out of it. It's something powerful when you take something out of the dark and allow God's light to shine on it. 
Sometimes the light is just me telling her. It, it takes half the enemy's power away when I just stay here. That's why the Bible tells us to confess one to us another. And so, part of integrity is being honest. Not with just yourself, but with others. More than anything, integrity is about being honest with God himself. And say, God, here I am. Here's what I'm dealing with. Here's the part that I know does not please you. And it's my heart's desire, more than anything in the world, to please you. It's my desire, as Octavia said, to represent you to the people around me. And the reward I desire to see is people coming to you because of me. Because they saw you through me. And so what I want to challenge everybody this morning in this room, I want you to stand to your feet. We're getting ready to go.